Welcome to another edition of A Voice to the Gentile Church. I'm Jim Winberger. Next to me is Pastor Roger Diaz. Next to him is Dolores Lowe. And, and you know, we do our best to not talk about things before we start, but we end up talking about them. And then, and then things don't get said, so we don't want to do that. Right. I'm sure you've got a lineup here of, of, of topics that you want to approach. Yeah. So go, go for it, Dolores. So I started with um, McCarthy running for... Speaker of the House. It's already because, an embarrassment. Yep, because we're on our fifth vote. He should be humiliated. Yeah. But he says he's not going anywhere. So for those who don't know, um, McCarthy's running for Speaker of the House. He was the head Republican in the House before right. we um, Republicans won the House. And he thought that he would be an automatic shoe-in for being Speaker of the House, right? Right. The problem is the Freedom Caucus in the House, which is a caucus made of the most conservative Republicans who are absolutely refusing to vote for McCarthy. And the reason they're refusing to vote for McCarthy is because they want, when Nancy Pelosi became Speaker of the House, she changed the procedural rules so that it becomes harder. It's almost impossible to get rid of the Speaker once you've elected them, right? Prior to Nancy Pelosi, you could do a vote of no confidence and replace the speaker. You know, a, a certain group of people, a, a certain group of congressmen could get together and bring it before the House and do a vote of no confidence and replace the speaker. Um, so that rule is gone, but the Freedom Caucus is saying, if we're going to vote for you, that rule needs to be back in. Right. And then um, they've also, they're also asking that he bring to the floor um, bills on immigration control of immigration and on um, inflation. And the, the, the logic that the Freedom Caucus has behind this is that Republicans, as we've always said, are no different than Democrats, right? right. We just passed, what, a humongous budget bill, right? The omnibus bill that I can tell you 90% of the people didn't know what they were voting on. Right. And Republicans are supposed to be the conservatives that are trying to keep financial reform going and all this, but they all voted for that bill, right? The 12 senators voted for it and then in the House, and it passed, right? Mm -hmm. So they're arguing that part of the problem during the midterm elections was that you can't tell the difference between a conservative, between a Republican and a Democrat, which I would agree with. So it's, it's gotten really heated. Um, the Freedom Caucus has nominated two individuals, actually three if you count Jordan, but Jordan doesn't want the job. He says he doesn't want to be speaker, and I don't blame him. Um, but they, the other two individuals are black Republicans. So um, there, there's this stress going on, right, between McCarthy saying he's not going anywhere and Republicans saying we're not voting for you. Matt Getz from Florida said, I'd rather vote for a Democrat before I vote for you. And basically it's because they see him as a rhino, right? Right. So. And Getz, Getz is a part of the Freedom Caucus? Yes. So it's, it's, well, not all Republicans are Republicans. Right. You know, that's, that's the way I see it. Republican is someone who supports the constitutional republic that we are. Right. And if you're behaving like a, like a Democrat, someone who supports democracy mm -hmm. as, democracy, as democracy really exists, then you're not a Republican yeah. because this country can never be a democracy. Yeah, and it's gotten so bad that Trump actually had to, they, he oh. called in and said, vote for McCarthy and this, this is looking really bad and all this stuff, oh. and they went, we don't care. Trump needs to be quiet. Yeah. yeah. He really so. needs to be quiet. He should have learned from the midterm elections that his word doesn't always help. Right. He's he's making he's making things worse for himself and for so so this else. is reminiscent of the last time we had the the Republicans yeah. had the House right we, if you remember Dan Webster was put up by the Freedom Caucus to be voted on and yeah. I don't know if you guys remember Dan West, Webster he's from Ocala right down here he's very conservative very very religious um, individual and. The same, almost the same thing happened, but the, free, the Freedom Caucus met with the rest of the Republicans, and they basically talked, in, talked them into, hey, no, you know, you need to 
back off and, you know, let's elect this guy, get it going, blah, 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 blah. Yeah, we'll do. And none of the promises were kept, right? Right. So the lesson learned is, I'm sorry, I want it in writing. Right. <laughs> so the possibility of someone unknown may arise. Right. And then, of course, AOC being AOC, it's like, oh, let's have a consensus government where we'll have a Democrat speaker, <laughs> even though we have a Republican majority. So it's, it's getting, it's interesting. But well, fifth vote, no Speaker of the House, three days into the session, no Speaker of the House. So. That's why I've become unpolitical, because right. yeah. it's just, I've given up on this country's political uh, yeah. opportunities. Well, speaking of countries' political opportunities, Brazil uh, now has a new president. That, that actually hurts more yep. than what's actually happening <clears throat> here, because if what's, if what's happening in Brazil is allowed to happen and the world does not, there is an outcry from the world, that's going to happen in other places as well. No, the world isn't going to do an outcry because yeah. Lula da Silva is all for, you know, everything mm -hmm. they believe in, climate change. Yeah, da Silva, da Silva is a lifelong hardcore leftist. Yep. Uh, you know, he, he has been tied to all sorts of criminal activity. I mean, he's Oh, and worst. he admitted it. Yeah. It's not yeah. even an allegation. He, no, he knows it. He, he pled guilty. <laughs> <laughs> Absolutely, and the worst kind of criminal criminal activity as well. Yes. So if if Brazil can put someone like him in and allow him to drive Bolsonaro out of the country, a president who has been good for Brazil for its economy, right. brought Brazil out of the the pandemic nicely. Uh, if if they will sit back and let this criminal, the Sousa, uh, the 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 Silva. the Silva do this, then they deserve what they get. But it's, it's ominous because if Brazil, such a powerhouse, a world powerhouse, can get away with something, we're not talking about some third world country, you know, backwater third world country yep. with, a, with a dictatorship. We're talking about a, a, a country, a well-established first world, almost first world country. Well, and the, and the uh, sad thing it is... It will happen here. Where else would it happen? He's, a, he's an outright communist. He may not be saying it, but he's an outright yeah. communist. Yeah, um, he's been that from, from yeah. his youth. Yeah. The tradition has been that the outgoing president puts the sash on the incoming president. But because Bolsonaro left Brazil, which he had to do because they were going to arrest him, right? Um, he had a garbage man put the sash on him, right? That's, that's a classic communist thing, right? Bolsonaro was... A, a strong conservative, he was really supportive of the, the evangelical Christians. He was not a big Orthodox Christian uh, guy. The, the Roman Catholics didn't like him. Because the Roman Catholics in South America, the, the Catholic movement in South America is very communist. Yes. And will support a liberal president before they support a conservative. That's how we got the Pope, right? But he was, yeah, <laughs> but he was very supportive of Israel, strong supporter of Israel. He was right. He was just the right guy. And to see him driven off like this, it's ominous. It tells me that if perhaps in the future a DeSantis becomes president, that this country can move to do the very same thing yeah. because DeSantis would be much like Bolsonaro. I mean, in many ways. Mm -hmm. So I'm not even thinking Trump anymore. Uh, I'm thinking ahead of Trump. But you see, the, the political situation doesn't really affect me anymore, but what happened in Brazil does affect me because De Silva, Lula De Silva, said that bef during the campaign that he was going to begin to take away Bibles from Christians mm. and that he's, he was going to be oppressive on the evangelical Christians in, in Brazil, especially the ones who support Israel. Yep. So, so yeah. that's ominous. That's, that's really, really ominous. So. Okay. And then let's go to the loony left coast of the U.S., California. <laughs> so it's a new year. I'll let you guys take this one. <laughs> it's a new year in California, right? And it's California, so what do we have? A ton of new laws, right? So among the new laws... Uh, someone out there <laughs> believes that every time they create a new law, they make life better for everyone. Uh, yeah. Uh, anyone looking at that and saying, this really doesn't make things better... Yep. Yeah. <laughs> so now um, California is a sanctuary state for transgender health. 
And this is already... It's such a beautiful state. It's mm, horrible. It is. I know, but it's terrible the way that it's running. So um, we now have a case of a father in Texas whose wife has wanted to tr transition his son. So she took the kids to California, and now he can't... He can't there's nothing. His parental rights have been mm -hmm. um, revoked. There's nothing he can do to try to save his child. Yeah. Right? Get ready. DCS yep. is going to begin to get more involved in these things nationwide. Yep. And that's when we're in trouble. Um, and then, of course, abortion now is king in California, which it, it has always been, right? Mm. This just sort of codifies it. Um, the minimum wage is up to $15.50. Um, uh, paid family leave gets increased to 60 or 70 percent of your income. So before their paid family leave was 55 percent of the income, now it's up to 60. This is the one that blows my mind. So if a rape occurs, you know, they take the woman to the doctor and they do a rape kit and they capture the DNA, right? If your DNA gets captured because you committed a rape, that DNA cannot be used in any other crime you committed. So say Monday he rapes this woman, and then he, he whatever happens, no bail, whatever, and on Tuesday, Tuesday he kills somebody, you can't use that DNA to prove that he was the murderer, which just blows my mind. I don't understand that one. It's just insane. Jaywalking is now legal. So if you get hit by a car, sorry. Um, and of course they're banning the, the traditional thing, no fur, um, all their banning of foods that are like banned in California where they're not banned anywhere else because they think, um, and, the, and one good one is they did pass, um, trafficking laws where if you're a bank or whatever and you're facilitating trafficking, then there's big penalties for you. But it's just, it's California and it's loony. It's just loony California right? Mm -hmm. I don't understand the people out there. I don't understand what their thought process is. It's just crazy. Well, okay. you can get ready because it's going to follow in Arizona as well. Yeah, they used to say that everything starts in California and well, moves, right? California and Arizona began to, to waltz with Agenda 21 about five years ago. Both states were talking about implementation and so I mean, they've gone the way of Australia, just about, right? Yep. yep. So it, it's, <laughs> and then it's we not, have... not pleasant, but <laughs> it's something we have to face down, right? Yep. And then we have the guy I cannot stand, and I have to say, I have to control myself, dear old Klaus Schwab. Oh, Klaus Schwab. 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 Yes, head of the World Economic Forum, who attended the G20 and kind of confuses me because the, the G20 is supposed to be for leaders. World leaders. World leaders, right, that have been elected. What well, country does that, he lead? None. None. And we're who thinking elected that, him? Uh, no one. Because even the World Economic Forum, he started, right? Yeah. So nobody had to vote for him. <laughs> okay. Yeah. The, the people who began that whole initiative back in the early 70s, you know, Trilateral Commission, World, Health, World Economic Forum, they were not elected officials. Right. They were They were... Uh, you know, cabinet choices and people that were powerful in the globalist organizations. Kissinger, you know, he was a cabinet choice. Yeah. Uh, what was he, Secretary of State or something? Mm -hmm. Yep. Secretary. Or Nixon, right? Nixon, yeah. right. So, no, they were they were, they they were not elected officials, and they didn't have to be because they were they were a society at that time, right? But mm -hmm. they they went from being a society to becoming leading factors in global po global politics. Yeah. So. Yeah, I'm not surprised. I mean, that doesn't surprise me at all. So uh, last year, if you all remember, we had, he gave us the Great Reset, right? Which got some really bad connotations because everybody saw through what it meant, right? So what do you do when the term that you've coined gets bad connotations? You re rename it. Rename it. Right? So he came to the G20 and he's now speaking about the Great Segmentation. So now it's not only the implementation of Agenda 2030, right? So we have the implementation of Agenda 2030. What he is now talking about, now remember, this man has not been elected by anyone. 
he's now talking about segmenting the world into certain sections where people in Minnesota, for example, would be responsible for growing corn. And only in Minnesota could you grow corn. Nowhere else in the world would you be allowed to grow corn. People in, let's say, Florida, what, what do we do in Florida? Big, we grow oranges, right? So no one else in the world would be allowed to grow oranges, not in Spain, not in California, only in Florida could you grow oranges, right? Now, this is the dumbest idea ever. Yeah. Because you need diversity, right? right? Let's say what happens when the weather is bad in one place right. and you lose the entire crop. Right. But we, we're seeing this, right? This is what well, to is, say it's dumb, you know, that's that's one of the things I, I recognize with conservatives. We hear about these really absurd plans of the globalists and we say that's wrong, that's not good, that's dumb. But it's way beyond that. Mm -hmm. I mean, we're looking at an all really and movement, something that's going to govern the entire world and subdue all of humanity. It's it's beyond dumb. It's it's horrifying. Yep. It's, and I mean, it's 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 it's, it's, it's been it's, driving me crazy because we saw this last week. We saw the folly of the electric vehicle, right? What happened How, last week? The really big blast of cold. Remember oh. that Buffalo was under. Well, what happens in cold weather is batteries drain really fast and batteries don't charge, right? right? So we saw a bunch of electric vehicles that could do nothing and go nowhere because it was too cold. I didn't know that happened. Yeah. But. And then, never mind the whole digging up the lithium to, you know, create those batteries and the way we're, you know, on the one hand, it's all, oh, take care of the environment. And on the other hand, oh, but we want electric vehicles and who cares? Let's just destroy the environment. Yeah. and turn children into slaves, right? Yeah, I mean, that's a big that's a big thing in Africa right now. Yeah, it is It is absolutely insane. Hundreds and thousands of people are living horrible, horrible lives, subjugated, digging up that lithium and uh, all the other all the other components that's necessary for cell phones and for, yep. you know, battery-operated vehicles. I mean, there's a huge black, blacked-out segment of, of reality that we're not dealing with about how those things come into existence. People are living lives that are akin to slavery. Right, absolutely. So, And being financed by all of us. That's right. right. Yeah. Okay, and then happy news. Happy. Happy news. I was just getting used to all the gloom and doom and <laughs> you can not, hopelessness. You can pass on the gym because exercise is now racist. Ah, I'm so relieved. <laughs> So those of you who don't want to exercise. I'm baffled as to how <laughs> exercise can be considered racism. So this, this professor at a private school in New York wrote this article where she is claiming that exercise is racist because it was, um, it came into existence in the 1900s to make white supremacists stronger. And of course, People on Twitter have like really panned her and, you know, are you stupid or whatever. Yeah. So, but she claims that exercise is racist. And she's famous because of it. Mm hmm. Break out the Krispy Kreme. <laughs> and then on happy news, this is probably more happy for me than for you guys. Being short. <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> Mating with shorter people is a step towards a greener planet. Because short people use less resources than Utah people. <laughs> there was a song. <laughs> I won't bring it up. <laughs> <laughs> so, yes. <laughs> that's cute. Yes. As someone who is five feet flat, that's great for me. <laughs> it's probably true. It's probably true. I did notice, since I'm 6'2", that most people that live in well into their 90s are not as tall as I am. <laughs> so there might be some relevance to that. I don't know, because for dogs, it's, no, yeah, for dogs, it's backwards, right? Little dogs live less than big dogs? Yeah. yeah. No, little dogs live longer than big dogs. Oh, okay. Big dogs so die youngly. Yeah. So maybe it's a truth universal, right? Yeah. <laughs> Seems well, possible. That's pretty amazing. Uh, <laughs> basketball players. So what do we do? Do we shorten yeah. their basketball hoop? And, yeah, I hadn't thought of that. Yeah. What would LeBron James say, right? Yeah. Well, well <laughs> he'd say it's good while it lasted. <laughs> <laughs> oh, 
So yeah. we have a question. Do you want to go for the question? Sure. How can we protect ourselves from ecumenicalism? As the one world religion starts to rapidly form, it has reached me locally, and I have been hearing Muslims in my own personal life say they believe Jesus is the Messiah, <clears throat> and the Catholic Church changing its definition on the Trinity, and friends that say they don't pray to idols, etc. Even Orthodox Jewish groups are trying to bring all the nations together, which is a beautiful thing. It's a very convincing, but also can be confusing because it sounds so good. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Well, <laughs> quite a question. Uh, keep in mind, let's look, at, let's look at the first part of the question. Keep in mind that in Islam, it is permissible, it is, it is advisable, it is something that they employ, that you can use what's called taqiyya, right? Mm -hmm. Taqiyya is effectively the, the permission to deceive and to speak uh, on both sides of your on both sides of your face concerning any issue you can you can take something that needs a pretty straightforward answer and you can spin it and say something that's completely different but then you're not making a blunt statement right like right. so they, they say that Jesus was risen he did rise we believe he rise but they're not saying that they believe that he was resurrected. Right. Because there's a great difference between saying someone rose than someone resurrected. Someone who was ill, from their point of view, from someone who was ill for six months and laid up on a bed for six months, can rise after six months. Even someone who is dead can be resuscitated and can rise again. So when they say that we believe that he, he did rise, they're not saying that they believe in the resurrection because they do not believe in the resurrection. I went to college with a lot of Muslims, and this issue came up all the time. And they mm -hmm. believed, at least what they told me, was that, they, that Jesus was, the body of Jesus was actually swapped at the cross. That's actually a traditional Jewish claim. Mm. The Jews believe that. You know, that, was the, that was the concern of Caiaphas mm -hmm. and Annas that they were going to swap right. his body. And since then, the Jewish people have said that. And so they're just hanging on to what the Jewish people said. I did live in a, in a Muslim community for seven years, and I heard all of the positions. And they believe that he is, in fact, a Messiah, a prophet, not the Messiah. Now they're changing it a little bit because they have to intensify tekiya. They have to step up their tekiya to, to adapt to this society that they're in. That's one thing about Islam. It's very, it functions very much like a pervasive disease. It comes in slowly, unrecognizable, but then you give it enough time and it begins to, to acclimate. And once it acclimates fully, it takes over. Yep. So right now, the acclimation process in this country is, yeah, he rose. We believe he rose from the dead. Yeah, we believe he is the Messiah, even though 50 years ago they would have said that he is a Messiah. He, he did save and... and you know, they wouldn't say he was the Mahdi. The right. Mahdi is a different right. character. He, he's not as, as, as important as the Mahdi. So it's just double talk. It's just basically, you know, Takiya lies, mm -hmm. to call it what it really is. It's, they're, they're lying. Uh, but they do it for the sake of, of promoting their movement. And that they've always done that. Again, they did that. Uh, way back in the times of the early movement of Islam, they did it. Yep. And they're just staying true to who they are. So in regards to Islam, I just, yeah, that's what they do. Now, the Roman Catholic system, changing their view of the Trinity, they too would in fact and does in fact employ tekiya. Now, not the Roman Catholic Church. I think we need to distinguish between the very traditional, very conservative, orthodox Catholic Church with the movement that's very leftist, very communist, which is the Jesuits. The Jesuit movement, the seed of the Jesuit movement has always been in the Vatican. Right. In, 15, in 1534, uh, Ignatius de la Royal, who was the founder of the Jesuits, he, he managed to codify an uh, organization within the context of the Vatican, and it became an official branch of the Vatican the Dominican order 
uh, were the ones behind it, and they were called the Jesuits. The Jesuits became very powerful very fast. Within the space of you know, 30 years, they had the Council of Trent, and the Council of Trent was all about the Jesuits. So somewhere in the Vatican, they were given tremendous power. So much power that it was, it was allowed for them to have a leader, the Jesuits, who would be called the Black Pope or the Hidden Pope, the Pope in the Dark. Black not being a racist statement, but right. being in right. the dark, unseen. Yeah. And, and that, that has always been there since 1534 with Ignatius de la Royale. The Jesuits have, have always had that hidden leader of the Vatican. Well, as it turns out, you know, when Benedict stepped down, and Benedict recently passed, but when he stepped down, about what, eight years ago? <laughs> yeah. Like yep. When he stepped down, a Jesuit pope stepped took up. that position, yeah. yep. and there never had been a Jesuit pope right. ever yeah. before. So here we are. We have the Jesuit movement that's sort of reforming the Roman Catholic system. Let's talk about this, uh, this movement, ecumenicalism. Uh, the word ecumenicalism, as was stated before the program, is not actually a word. I kind of coined it. I, co I say ecumenicalism because it's an ideology, so I tacked ism onto it. Um, they, they, that's not a... That's not a that's not a, uh, that they don't want to be called an ecumenicalism. That's not what, that's not favorable at all. <laughs> to say that they're ecumenicalistic, uh, it's not favorable. Because they see ecumenicalism as a good thing, right? So ecumenicalism right. really began in the, well, 1910 is when the first movement began. The Protestants and the Anglicans in, in England and, and Scotland and so on uh, <laughs> began to forge together. Let's come together for the sake of missionary endeavors and church building. So the Anglicans and the, and the Protestants, namely the Presbyterians and Methodists, began to work together, all in, in the vein of, of you know, unity. That's mm -hmm. how it began. But behind that movement were globalists. They, the same ones who were pushing the whole global push at the end of the 1800s into the 1900s were the ones who were behind that initial movement. So the road to hell is paved with good intentions. In this case, the road to hell was paved with bad intentions yeah. because they intended from the very beginning to bring about an order that will not only include all Christians, Protestants and Anglicans, but all religions. And so how do you go from an order in London, England and, and Glasgow that had determined to Protestants, you know, Presbyterians and Methodists and so on, and Anglicans, well, how do you go from that to bring in Muslims in and, 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 and Buddhists in and Taoists in and Satanists? How, how do you get there? Well, it's a, it's a, it's a, it's a road that you have to be, uh, you have to be on that road. Uh, but they, they got on that road right around 1910 and 1948 is when it began to, to coalesce and come together. Now, the Vatican officially was not supportive of it until the Second Vatican, Second Vatican Council, which was a big event. The, the, one of the, 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 the most important issues to be addressed at the Second Vatican Council in 1964 was the issue of ecumenicalism. That was their, that was their big issue to address. And on the right in the Catholic Church, in the Vatican, were those who were saying, like what I would say, no, it's globalization. What does that have to do with the church? On the, on the other side of the aisle, on the left, you had mostly the Jesuits who were saying, no, we need this. And of course, we know who, who won. We know who prevailed. <laughs> yeah. The Jesuits did. But the truth is, it was the Jesuits who was initially behind this to begin with. This goes back to the formation of the Illuminati, which was a Jesuit initiative. It's amazing to me that there are people that are trying to deny that the Illuminati was not a Jesuit initiative. It was. Adam Weishaupt, even though himself was not an official Jesuit, he was educated by the Jesuits. He was mentored and counseled by the Jesuits. He formed this, this globalist organization called the Illuminati. Of course, he would not officially be a Jesuit. They're not that naive. They would not have a, a legitimate Jesuit priest establish an order like that. But he was trained and he was educated by the Jesuits. And they supported it. 
they were behind it. Of right? course. So the Jesuits, listen, uh, from what I say here, I can easily be marked for death, my statements, because the Jesuits are that powerful. They're that powerful. The only reason I don't, I don't trouble them as much is because I'm nobody. Right. I'm a small right. voice. Yeah. I'm not a Jesuit. Uh, I'm, I'm uh, uh, you know, I'm a rogue Protestant as far as they're concerned. They leave me alone. Even a rogue from, Protestant. <laughs> from their from their point of view, he he is he's marked as a crazy guy. Let him yeah. let him talk. Let him prove that the people on that side of the issue are all lunatics, and that's how they would treat me. But right. the truth is, my my position and position of many others are rapidly being received and understood and recognized that they are behind most, if not all, of the globalist organizations and efforts that exist in the world. They were behind global ecumenicalism. Mm -hmm. uh, how do you go from, from that, Protestants and Anglicans, to become what we see today? What happened on, on the pseudo Mount Sinai in Egypt, right? Oh, yep. Uh, how where do you go from where you had represent, representatives from every pagan religion, it mm -hmm. seemed, together with Catholics, together with, with Anglicans and Buddhists and everything. Even Just Satanists. Yep. Standing there and claiming some sort of a unity. Yeah. Well, and the thing that gets me is they, they were perfectly willing to twist scripture ah. of every religion to get to that one kumbaya, we're all going to hold well, our hands and sing They've together. been doing that, well, they, such, such spirits mm -hmm. have been doing that since Nicaea and even before, yeah. <laughs> right, even before. Yeah. Uh, when you think about the, 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 the Sadduceic movement and how they came to power in, in Israel during the time of Jesus before, they were Greeks, mm -hmm. they were Hellenistic. Yep. And they had Hellenistic ideology. And how did they become so powerful? Same thing. The Pharisees were more fundamental. They were more Bible believers. And they had to give way to the Sadducees because the Sadducees had worked their way into power. Right? So, so this is a great, great concern, a threat. Uh, although many people, this is oblivious. Many people are oblivious yep. to this. In fact, they see it, but some may even say it's a good thing, right? Well, when you first started talking about it, I was like, You thought I was a, a lunatic, yeah. right? So I went and did my research, right? That's, that's what I like to do. Mm -hmm. And I was shocked <laughs> at what I found. <laughs> and then you follow the threads, right? Mm -hmm. And what's the most liberal university in the United States? Harvard. It's a Jesuit Yale. school, right? Yale. <laughs> and then you're like, oh my gosh. It's, so it's, it's Georgetown. Yes. Yeah. It's, it's just, and it's not surprising when you, when you go all back in Ivy history. League and schools, look, all yeah. of the Ivy League schools qualify, but all of the universities qualify. Yep. 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 And it's funny because I was listening to Albert Moeller. He's, he's a Protestant um, speaker, <laughs> um, head of Boyd's College, which is a seminary. And he brought it up also. He, he, he did the whole Jesuit yeah. timeline. And I was like, oh, wow, this is now becoming mainstream. We're, more we're people really are, More it. people are free to talk about it. It used to be that it was well known in certain circles that if you talk about this, you can, if you have a loud enough voice, you can end up being uh, silenced. Mm -hmm. um, because the Jesuits have that code. Uh, the Jesuit movement is a degree-oriented system, like the Freemasons and the Scottish Rite. Right, I was yep. going to say, the Masons yeah. are the same thing. And the Jesuits now, unlike the, the Masons and the, the, the uh, Scottish Rite, the Jesuits, they have degrees up to 96 degrees. So, you, in other words, you have, in this esoteric movement, you have much higher to ascend. So you have much more powerful people in higher places. And they, they function in, in the dark. And that's why it's esoteric. That's why it's occultic. So it's interesting, right? All these organizations that are basically heretical all have levels of ascendancy, right? Like yep. Scientology is the same way, right? Absolutely. You get to all these levels. Uh, even some quote-unquote Christian denominations, mm -hmm. it's like that, the Jehovah Witness. Yep. There is that system there. It's a pyramidal system. Very clear, it's a pyramidal system you ascend. Mm -hmm. You ascend to the top, the closer you get to the top, the more important you are, the more illuminated you are. And that's the whole point to the symbol of the, uh, the pyramid for the Illuminati. You see, if you look at that pyramid, the base stones are smaller. As you go bigger, they get bigger. And then at the top, you have a gold capstone. Mm -hmm. And so that's the whole point to the system. 
it's uh, all right. So let's talk about why this is a concern. So I just kind of briefly answer the question. We can we can look at that question much much more uh, in depthly. But let's talk about why is this a concern. This is a concern to families. If you're raising children in this country, you should, and you're you're a believer, and you want them to be free thinking, Bible believing people. This is a threat, because everywhere they go, they're going to encounter this opposition. You have grandchildren, you have children, you have, you have grandchildren, uh, you want them to be free, and this is the whole point here. The freedom caucus, yeah, you want them to be free to believe, to study the Bible and believe it based on its own merit. This is a threat. This is a big threat. I talk about Bolsonaro being ousted from Brazil, basically. Uh, the Lula da Silva saying that we're going to do away with Bibles, we're going to clamp down on the conservatives, especially the Israel-loving Christians. All right, so this movement is going to lead to that happening in the great Western countries. Brazil is a great Western country. It is no longer, it's kind of on the, on the verge of becoming first world country. I guess you could say it's high second world country. So, but you have this movement that can lend itself to this happening here. It's a threat to freedom-loving Bible believers everywhere. It's a threat to civilization. It threatens our civilization. Our civilization is based on the idea that we can exercise our freedom to believe the Bible and act upon it. You know, when this country was founded and freedom of religion came into being, this is what they were concerned about. The people that initially uh, began to promote the idea of freedom of religion were Jews. I don't know if you know this. The, the, the expelled Jews from Spain and Portugal that came to the West, uh, after Columbus's journeys, they began, to be, they began to establish communities in the hundreds throughout the Americas, even in the Southwest, hundreds of communities. And they, they were embracing the idea of freedom of religion. Here in the Great West, we're free to, believe, to be who we are. Mm -hmm. This is where, this is the seed, this is the, this is where, it, I, I can't say it was germinated because I have to use the word germ, but this is the nucleus of freedom of religion. When Jews were expelled from Spain and Portugal, and they were allowed to come here and establish communities where they were actually practicing Jewish, their Jewish belief, their the, the, the faith of Israel and freedom, they pushed it. Then Haim Solomon, you know who Haim Solomon is? He's the guy that financed oh, yes. uh, the, Revolutionary the Revolutionary War. War. Right? Mm -hmm. He was a great, great financier of, um, of George Washington. Yeah. In fact, um, history, actual history, will tell you that that war would not have been won without Haim Solomon. He put a lot of his backing into it. Well, why? Because Haim Solomon was a displaced Sephardic Jew. People need to, to understand this. And there were many like Haim Solomon that didn't make it into the history books who put together their finances to support that effort to separate from Europe because they knew that if they would separate from Europe, they would be able to be free practicing sons of Israel Jews in the Americas. So that's where it comes from. It's about freedom, have, not having an oppressive entity uh, deciding what you believe. Now here we are today, we've made full circle, mm -hmm. where our freedom to believe the Bible and practice what we believe is being threatened. Right. Mm -hmm. so, so, you know, um, this, this pop star right now, this icon, what's his name? I don't even want to remember his name. Kanye West? Oh, oh Kanye. 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 Kanye West? Yeah, or yay. Yay. Or yeah. Yay. I'm Isn't sorry. He, is, he, is he actually missing now? I, I heard that he was I missing. heard, that's what I heard that his yeah. um, agent, former, uh, about to be former agent, yeah. said he was missing, yeah. So he went after the Jewish people with a, with a vengeance. All right. The, the Jewish people in this country has fought for freedom, but they've done it in the wrong way. And I'm not going to get into that to qualify in that statement. Their efforts in this country has been to keep the status of freedom. And in doing so, they've recognized every conservative movement as a threat when right. we were not a threat. The fact is, the people on the left were the actual threat to their existence. Mm -hmm. So the Jewish communities in this country supported the people on the left. The bottom line is this, they are not true leftists. Right. When you get down to the core of it, the Jewish communities are very, very Bible-believing. 
but they 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 fostered an environment where they believed that the left was the, the liberal movement, which is no longer a liberal movement. It's a fascist movement. Right. Mm -hmm. Yep. A true liberalism now is being found in the conservative movement. Well, I always argue that liberals vote for policy that they would never accept in their personal lives. Uh, yep. So and and so Kanye West is reacting to the idea that the Jewish people are the reason for all of the troubles in the country. And you can understand why some people would run to that, to that, to that conclusion. But the truth is, they were the ones who brought freedom of religion to this land, to the world, actually. Mm -hmm. And they did it as displaced Jews who wanted a place to exercise their faith freedom, uh, their, their faith freely. We've talked about Columbus and his actual initiative, right? Right. That he was actually looking to provide such environments for communities that were wanting to exercise who they were freely. That's what Columbus was working towards, actually working towards. Um, Columbus had to do that as a spy, incognito. Why? Because he, he couldn't have done that openly, right? Because when he left Spain, uh, he sailed from Spain, he stopped in Madeira, Port uh, the, uh, the Straits of Gibraltar, he went to Madeira and he came to the West. All right. That whole journey was done at the very time that Jews were being expelled from Spain. And while he was sailing past uh, Portugal to Madeira to the islands, Jews were hopping over the border coming into Portugal, fleeing for their lives, for freedom, freedom to, 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 to be free to study the word. Of course, in 1497, it happened in Portugal too. It was worse in Portugal, actually. The subjugation, the forced conversions, were much worse. So, so freedom is what's at stake here with this movement because this movement is much worse, much worse than what the Inquisition was doing because we're seeing the preliminary stages of it now where they're setting their ideology in place. Mm -hmm. and, and once that ideology is accepted by everyone, then they can begin to act upon it, to subjugate, to, to literally introduce violence. So once their ideologies are accepted, that's when they can say, okay, the time has come to, to, to fulfill. Right. So it's, it's, it's something that we all ought to be aware of. Ecumenicalism is not a friend to actual Bible believers. We like, with some of us, we like the idea of we're all getting along, you know, mm -hmm. the Baptists and the Methodists and the, and the non-denominational folk. Uh, we can all just sort of have services together, together with the Roman Catholics, and everybody will get along just fine. And that sounds real good. It looks good on paper, but the reality is it will invariably lead to uh, Well, the Catholic mayhem. Church has been pushing in that direction ever since Martin Luther. Right, because they're trying to get it back to how it was. Well, no, the Catholic <laughs> Church, official position of the Catholic Church was we need to stamp out the Protestants. We need to subjugate this movement because we are the true church. Right. We don't want to have right. anything to do with ecumenicalism. It was the Jesuits working in the context okay. of, the, right. of the Roman Catholics that gotcha. were working towards that. And that's why in 1910, when ecumenicalism was introduced, Catholics said, no, we want nothing to do that. That's incongruent with our, with our mission right. statement. And that was 1910. So 1964, 54 years later, is when they had the Second Vatican, Vatican Council, and it was accepted. The, the movement to embrace so ecumenism. It was a way to yeah, maneuver it back Absolutely. In. And it was the Jesuits who were behind that. Right. So then came Pope John Paul II, the great unifier. Well, what was that about? That was about Second Vatican, Second Vatican Council ideology, ecumenicalism, to be accepted. So he went around the world preaching that message, right? That's right. what he did. Yep. And then Benedict came along doing the same thing. And now Francis is absolutely the champion of this movement. Well, not all the Catholics agree with that. No, 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 and no, no. My sister-in-law is Catholic, and she doesn't like what Francis is doing. Right. Uh, well, yes, and that's absolutely the case. Now, when Pope John Paul II came on the scene, everyone loved him. He had a nice, sweet yes. demeanor, and he said his uh, soliloquies and so on were really wonderful. Uh, and, and he was well accepted by everyone, but they didn't listen carefully to what he was saying. Right. He was speaking globalization. He was speaking ecumenicalism. Well, you know, what people forget is there is truth. 
right? And you are what you are because you believe a certain truth. So Catholics are Catholics because they believe in the Catholic catechism. Protestants are Protestants because we realize there were problems, right? Right. But what they forget is in order for all of us to get along and sing Kumbaya and shake hands, you have to give up some of your truth. So, and that's what happened, right? right? So in 1985, I remember seeing this with my own eyes. I came up here from the islands, from Trinidad in 84. I sat in front of a TV somewhere in late 85, and I saw CNN doing a special on this great <laughs> ecumenical movement meeting, I should say. This is, uh, what, 20-something years after the Second Vatican Council. Uh, where they met in Africa, all of the leading bishops of, of the Roman Catholic world met in some African country, and I can't remember which country, but they all met there. And in 1985, that, the purpose of that meeting was to initiate a process by which by the year 2000, they would have the framework for a world government. I'll never forget it. I wasn't even, even a believer, but when I heard that, I knew in, my, in the depths of my being that that was wrong. Right. Mm -hmm. uh, right, that was that was right. very different, very wrong, and I knew it was. And so they they put that whole thing in place in 1985. Well, all they really did in 1985 is they exposed it to the world. That's why CNN was promoting it, right, pushing it, putting it out there. So what happened in the year 2000? Before the year 2000, 1999, and you can look this up, the Vatican came out. They had some sort of a mini council, <laughs> and they determined that well. The reformers were correct. You're justified by faith only, not by catechism. Right. Not by the works of the catechism, not by law. So you're justified by faith. They came out and said, yes, we concede. We were wrong. And you know what they did? From that moment going forward, they decreed it or declared that, well, we're all Catholics again. Right. Because there's no need for right. uh, a, ref a reformation, mm -hmm. a Protestant movement, if mm -hmm. we are, in fact, agreeing with Martin Luther. And that's what they did. So they have, they have gone forward now, not getting the approval of Protestants, and saying, well, we're all Catholics again. Now, I'll never forget that great ecumenical uh, thing that they had with Kenneth Copeland and many of right. the... Not the, that long mm -hmm. ago, right. a few years back. Yep. About uh, eight years ago, they had this huge come together with Skype. They had a Skype screen that was must have been 50 by 20. Yep. high, and they had the Pope Fee. on there. <laughs> they had the Pope on there. But before the Pope came on, they had a young Jesuit priest. And they said it. They said he was a Jesuit priest. They had a young Jesuit priest on there. He was eloquent. I mean, he had a silver tongue. He was speaking unity. He was speaking, look at this. This is what we should all be working towards. You are all, um, you know, you're all Pentecostal pastors. You, you're leading the, the, the most important Pentecostal, ch Pentecostal churches in this country. And we all believe in the baptism of the Holy Spirit. Hallelujah. And they started praying in tongues and so on. And he said, well, the time has come to make it official. So we have a special guest. As if it was a big surprise to everyone. We have a special guest that's going to join us tonight. It is Pope Francis. Whoops, he's on. And so he's talking now with the whole crowd, and he's given his spiel, you know, globalist stuff and unity and so on. And he said it. He said, we're now all Catholics again. And when he said that, he said there's no more, pro we concede that, that justification is by faith. There's no more Protestant movement. We're all Catholics again. Ken Copeland and the rest got up, and they began to praise God. I would have vomited. They began to praise God, and the whole place erupted in praise. Uh, who, who were they praising? Uh, yeah. I, yeah. So the Catholic God. Ugh. So they were praising the efforts of the Jesuits, who had accomplished such a thing. Yeah. So, so you see what I'm saying? 1985. We'll put this together by the year 2000. 1999. They they make this declaration of a position. Going into the new millennia now, they're introducing the Pope as this great unifier. And now we're seeing the actual foundation of a global religion. You have yep. the Abrahamic Accords. You have the, that's why I, I said, Trump no more. Right. That's, my, that's my slogan, Trump no more. Uh, because he got behind this Abrahamic Accords thing. Together with the Abrahamic Accords is the Abrahamic House that came into existence at the same time, which is... Uh, a Jewish, Christian, Muslim unity center in Bahrain. Trump okayed that. Remember when Trump went to Bahrain and he put his hand on that white ball 
You don't remember oh, that? Oh, I remember that, yeah. Yeah, you know what that was about? The unity of fates. Mm. Oh, but we also have the Protestants working towards it, right? I still remember yeah, Rick Warren at Saddleback bringing all those Muslims into his service, It's a, it's right? a united I effort. stuck with this book. Yeah, I'm like, wow. United we stand, divided we fall. And that's their, mo that's and their I mean, motivation. They look at us and they say that we're divisive and we're hateful. Of course. When in reality, <laughs> what course. we are saying is, there is a truth, this is a truth we believe, and we're not willing to sacrifice it just so we can all sing Kumbaya together. We are together. happily intolerant when it comes to yeah. God's word. God's word is the final arbitration of truth yeah. for us. We stand on it. We are intolerant. Yeah. Right. We would argue Luther only addressed one subject. Right. Yeah. There's about 20 more that need addressing. Absolutely. Yes. So you see, this, this, is, this is not something that happened, you know, I used to play pool. This is not a fluke, you know. Right. This, this was well planned, well executed, brought together by very, very cunning, uh, crafty men. Mm -hmm. And it's a consorted effort. You have many fronts to this, to this campaign. And sometimes you look at the different fronts and you say, well, they could not be working together. They have to be against each other, but the truth is they are working together. So I've looked into the Universalist Church, right? And okay. I find it an abomination, right? I'm like, sure. But I think many Protestants and Catholics alike who are lining themselves up with this stuff would be shocked that this is exactly what the universalists have always said, right? Yep. All religions are the same, God's the same, blah, 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 right? Absolutely. It's just, it's shocking. You, you mentioned Rick Warren, right? Mm -hmm. He is, well, he's a, you know, it's kind of like <laughs> the Great Reset. You don't say the Great Reset anymore. You say right. the, the Great Segmentation. segmentation. <laughs> well, you don't use, they don't use the phrase the emergent church anymore. Right. Because the phrase the emergent church became tainted with the reality of who they were and what they were doing. I don't even know what they call themselves today, yeah. the Grace Church or something. But back at the end of the 1900s, towards the beginning of the new millennia, they were tossing that phrase around, left, right, mm -hmm. and center. Yep. The, the emerging church, a church is emerging that's going to be different than the church of the 1980s. Uh, you know, we're going to be pressing forward into the new millennia. We're going to be giving Jesus to the masses. They emerge and we emerge. They don't use it anymore because nope. they were exposed. All right. They're still, they're still very much there. And so Saddleback Church, is that what it is? Yep, Saddleback. Right. There's something there it's that like just doesn't spider. sound right. <laughs> it's a Saddleback Spider. Saddleback Church. I really zappy. Like good anyway. one. So Rick Warren and most of these people, you know, we have a local pastor here who went. Yep. <laughs> went to one of these ecumenical meetings in Bahrain, the one where Trump rolled his hand over the ball and everything. Uh, this, this movement is still very much, well, it is the, the offspring of the emerging church. And it's very strong in this country, very powerful in this country. Uh, the, the, the mega churches in our little vicinity here are fully and totally committed. I'm not just saying this because I want to be I want to use a shock value here. I'm not just trying to shock people. It is true. I don't go out to visit these churches, but I know people who have gone out and they come to me. And some people come to me secretly and they say, you've been correct. You've been correct about what you've been saying because sure. I just went to that church over there and yeah, that's what they're doing. Yeah. I'm like, okay, I'll keep it between me and you. I won't, I won't tell anyone that you came to me. But that's happening, folks. The mega churches, our mega churches, have completely gone on board with the Jesuit movement. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yep. And they're completely given over to it. So the question, uh, the question begs the answer, which, which is, what do we do? What can we do? Right. I would say, follow the words of Jesus. Be wise as serpents. Gentle as doves. Be wise as serpents. Uh, in regards to the mark of the beast, because that's where this is going. Right. This world religion is the false prophet of Revelation chapter 13 on to 16 on to 19 and even into 20. What's the end of the false prophet? We've seen in Revelation chapter 20, its place is in the lake of fire. The false prophet is a beast, which is a government. We see it in Revelation chapter 13. 
This government is global, like the first beast, but it's not like the first beast, it's religious. Has two horns like a lamb, but speaks. You see, the word but there is very important. Has two horns like a lamb, so it looks like a lamb, but but it speaks for the dav for the dragon for the right. dragon for the devil yep. looks like jesus but 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 it really speaks for the devil that's the second beast that's the false prophet that thing amalgamates into the false prophet and we need to be we need to be understanding here because the beast of revelation chapter 11 or actually daniel 7 11 revelation 13 and onwards remains the beast the second beast of Revelation chapter 13 transforms into the new prophet, into the uh, false prophet. You see that? Mm -hmm. So it, it starts, starts off as a, a governmental type organization, well, ecumenicalism, right. you know, let's all come together. You know, it started with the good Presbyterians and the Anglicans, but then it didn't stay there. Now there's a government, right? Uh, uh, and we know that, that Francis has been talking about this government, this religious government. So it, it, comes, it comes from being a government, it becomes a false prophet. But what does it do? This is the important question. It, it deceives the entire world to take the mark of the beast. Yeah. And that's important. So we have to be able to recognize the mark of the beast. The time will come when it will become so critical for us to know what the mark of the beast is exactly, and to recognize it. So we have to be wise as serpents. We have to be ready, equipped to recognize the mark of the beast. Because it is going to be subtle. It is going to be incredibly deceptive. And it's already out there. People are already taking it. <sighs> We've talked about the mark of the beast. It's not a physical thing. It's not a chip. It's not a, you know, whatever. It is an ideology. It's a state of mind. It is what you put your work towards, the right hand. So... I would say also you need to pray for your loved ones. Pray for your loved ones. Mm -hmm. If you have loved ones that are susceptible to the world system and are easily buying into the, to the deception of this movement, you really need to pray for them a lot. You know, this is a time for real believers to be on their knees and to pray and to intercede. Jesus said, when the Son of Man comes, will he find faith? Those on his knees, right? That's what he said. That's exactly what it said. Would the elect be on their knees praying when he comes? That's what we have to be doing at this point. We have to, to, we have to gird ourselves up and solidify ourselves in God's word. God's word is a light unto us. God's word is the light that shines in us. And that light will repel darkness. If you, are, if you, are in such a, if you live in such an, an end time environment, such as what we're seeing. If that's where we are and that's who you are, you are, you are counter globalist beast world religion. That's, if that's who you are, you, you're going to have it, you're going to have a very difficult time to stand without light. Right. If you're standing without light, you're going to be easy prey. If you are the light of the world at that time, if God's light is shining brightly in you, then what will happen? You will repel the darkness. The darkness will flee. That's what Jesus, didn't Jesus say something like that? What did he say concerning the, the darkness fleeing? Man, darkness will flee because of the light that's in you. So this is the exhortation for us, the strongest exhortation for us. Yeah, be wise as serpent, know and recognize the mark of the beast, intercede for your loved ones, Gird up, prepare yourselves for what's coming, but be strong in God's word and be that light. That light will push off darkness every time, every time. So, I put one of my posts on Facebook. I'm going to pull my Facebook. I don't, is this allowed? I don't. Sure. <laughs> so, I'm going to pull my Facebook, and I have a little thing on Facebook here. It's my uh, little, you know, you do your story. And it's a quote from Ephesians chapter 5, verse 8. Once you lived in, dar in the dark, in darkness. Once you lived in darkness, but now the Lord has filled you with light. Live as children who have light. Ephesians chapter 5, verse 8. So Paul understood the importance of being in that light. You know, Jesus is the word of God. John chapter 1. He is mm -hmm. the word. Right. But it also says that the life that was in this word was the light that shone in all men. So if you have his life in you, that light will shine in you. 
that light will push that darkness back every time. And we should, and we should, we should know this because we will have nothing to fear in this world. All right, so let's say this beast is, is, is towering. It's, it's a juggernaut government in the world. How powerful is that? But could it stand against the light? Could it really, really come against those who are in the light? No, it I cannot. Not. It cannot. In fact, what we see in Revelation chapter 11 is that those who serve God in the light, so Revelation chapter 11, the menorah, and the two witnesses on either side of it. What does that tell us? The menorah is a source of light, and standing right in the light are the two witnesses. So if we lit a menorah in a dark room and you stand next to it, you become that light. The light becomes you. So these two witnesses standing on either side of the menorah, what were they doing to the beast? They were terrorizing the beast system. Mm -hmm. Of course, finally, they were laid down and they were raptured up three days later. Right. We're all going to lay down. Right. We're yep. all going to lay down. Yep. We're all going to rapture. We need to understand that. But do not be afraid for your life because that's the strength that the system has over you. If you're afraid for your physical life, <clears throat> your, your, your suki, you're not going to shine. Your, your light is going to be dull, very dull. You will ha you'll have no light if you're afraid for your suki. But if your zoe is what's important, your light will shine brightly and the system will flee from you. That, that's, that's my belief. And, and so, so, yeah, this, this movement is ominous. It's a juggernaut. It's a beast. <laughs> it's right. a towering beast. Remember when Daniel saw the same beast in Daniel chapter 7? What did it do to Daniel? Daniel was querying this beast throughout the book. Even in Revelation, in Daniel chapter 12, he was saying at the end of his book, what is this thing? What is this beast? Right. It troubled him greatly because it's ominous. It's horrible. It's right. horrifying. Daniel couldn't even relate it to something he saw in nature. The first beast that Daniel saw in Daniel chapter 7, a lion with wings. Yeah, okay, so we, we can understand that. The second beast was a bear with iron teeth and iron claws. Okay, pretty, pretty awful. The third beast was a leopard with wings and four heads and four sets of wings. Pretty weird, but okay, so it's a leopard. The fourth beast was unlike anything else. Nothing. He, he, could, he, he had nothing, no frame of reference to pull from. What does that tell us? The fourth beast is horrible. That's what we're going to face down. That's exactly what we're facing down. And you know what? In that place of light, we are like Hananiah, Hananel, Shadrach, not Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego. Hananiah, <laughs> Mishael, and Azariah, the friends of Daniel. Yeah. In the furnace, yeah. we are like them. That light, that, that, that light is that fire in us. So we have to have that fire burning in us. Oh, Ken used to say, have identity with Israel, and well, the beast won't want to have anything to do with you. push you in that direction. Yeah. But your identity, though, yes, I agree. But your identity has to be firmly grounded in the word of God. Right. right. A no, lot of people identify with that. Israel, they wear zitzi and yarmulke, and they're not really on standing right. on God's word. Right. So stand on God's word firmly, and you will identify with the true Israel, the Israel of God. You will. It's just powerful, for the course. But you will become an instant enemy of the system. But the system will, will, will back away from you. The system will be afraid of you because the system knows who you are. <laughs> the beast knows who you are. The stronger, the more yielded you are to God's word, being that light, is the more the system is afraid of you. So your loved ones who tend to be a bit wishy-washy, you know, on the fence, you really need to pray for them. Yeah. When this thing cracks open and it will crack open, what would they do? Would they capitulate? So here's what you do with your family members like that. You speak it. You speak it out to them. And they'll laugh at you. They'll mock you. they say, I'm never going to talk to you again. Uh, you know, uh, you're just crazy. But you speak it. And you speak it again. When it unfolds, they will recognize it. Yeah. That's been my approach. Uh, you know, as a congregation, you've been getting that from me. Mm -hmm. um, yeah. You, you speak it, you lay it out there. If you know it's the truth, it's on God's word. You, you put it out there. And when it begins to manifest, that's when the Holy Spirit will quicken the reality of it in them. And they'll have a choice. They'll have their opportunity to say yea or nay. 
I think that's our program. Yep. And if this question has raised other questions in your thinking, and surely it does, uh, you are at liberty to share them with us. The easiest way to do that is to email us at voice at buildupzion.org. Voice at buildupzion.org. And until next week, Shalom. Shalom.